Hello everyone and welcome to PASS Virtual Summit 2020. I really wish we were all in Houston learning new things and having fun in the community area, but unfortunately it was not to be. I still think that PASS Virtual Summit is going to be fantastic. There is great amount of educational content of course, many tracks and many days in many different time zones. So I really hope you enjoy it. Today we are going to focus on what's going on in my Power BI environment. It's about monitoring Power BI so that your implementation can go better and you know if you are compliant. So let's dig in and look at what's going on in my Power BI environment. Before we dive into the content, here's a small reminder of what PASS offers. PASS offers so much more than just PASS Summit. There are virtual groups, there are local groups, and there's a new PASS Pro membership. There are so many things that PASS has to offer. So when the session is over, you can head over to PASS.org and find out what PASS has to offer for someone like yourself. My name is Oski Gunnarsson. I run a small consultancy called North Insights in Denmark. I come originally from Iceland. My contact information are on the slides, so if you want to get in touch, you're welcome to do. Uh, you will, of course, get the slides, so you can always, you know, you don't have to remember it or write it down right now. I'm a Power Platform MVP. I've been working in BI for the last uh, around 15 years. I am the leader of the Icelandic Power BI user group and I'm the Icelandic uh, PASS group as well. I've been working with uh, Power BI since Power BI started, and before that with the, uh, the predecessor, uh, Power Pivot and Power Query in Excel. The agenda for today is that I'm going to shortly touch on why I'm doing a session about this particular topic. Then I'm going to talk about the objectives for the session, which we hopefully will have covered when the session is over. Then we're going to talk about Power BI governance in a little bit more broader perspective before we dive into each and every one of the sections that I think you should be monitoring and then also, of course, why you should be monitoring them. And then we're going to end up talking about uh, what we can do with the monitoring data that we get out of uh, Power BI monitoring. So why am I talking about this topic? When I started out uh, being a Power BI administrator, there was uh, I was an, what we call an accidental administrator. I was the first one and the best one to use Power BI in the company I used to work for, and thereby I became the Power BI administrator. I've talked to a lot of people around the world, you know, who have been met in conferences or just my clients or other people that I met, and this seemed to be a, a, a general theme that, you know, the first one or the best one to use Power BI, they become the Power BI administrator. And we were not used to being Power BI, we used to being administrators of a, of a um, um, software. So uh, we're not sure exactly how to tackle these things. And one of the things that you need to tackle as an administrator is how you monitor uh, the, the software that you're running. It is not very easy to get anything out of Power BI. There is no nice client you go into where you can just get a, you know, some kind of a built-in thing which tells you about what's going on in your environment. You need to build it yourself and you need to uh, extract it out. Um, so. This was one of the reasons where I, because I, when I had to do this, I realized that it was something that probably other people could you know, learn from as well. Another thing that I noticed when I was a Power BI Administrator, I was asked frequently by st all kinds of stakeholders, of it, how is it going? How is the implementation going? Um, and then I, you know, after, when I started answering those questions, I realized I needed data to answer those questions. And that also inspired me to do this session here. And of course, uh, as the administrator of, uh, of, uh, of Power BI, I, I needed to uh, follow some, uh, adhere to some governance principles. Uh, and monitoring is, of course, a big, big part of it. So I had to do it. Uh, I wanted to do it, and I could do it. And I think uh, that other people can hopefully learn from my experience. So the objectives for the session are, I will hopefully, when we are done with the session, you uh, know why you should be monitoring Power BI you know what you should be monitoring when it comes to Power BI, you know how you can monitor Power BI, and you know how to uh, what and what you cannot automate, and then you know how you can report on data. The last part on how you can report on data is, of course, there's no, uh, there's no uh, right or wrong there. You can monitor on all kinds of things. What I, what I hope to do is I hope you inspire you with some uh, samples of what you can do with the data uh, so that you can set up more in, uh, the reporting on top of the monitoring data in your own organization. Before we start diving into the monitoring, uh, I just want to touch more broadly on Power BI governance. In my Power BI governance model, uh, you have four pillars it rests on. It's processes, 
training, monitoring, and roles. All of those pillars are very important, but only one of them is a technical thing, and that is the uh, monitoring part. So today we are only going to focus on the monitoring part. Uh, that doesn't mean that this is the, the, the most important or more important than the others. It just means that this is one where we're going to focus on, on the technical skills. This session is focused on the cloud version of Power BI. But before I go into it, I just want to touch briefly on Power BI Repo Server. If you have Power BI Repo Server, so if you're on-premise, uh, monitoring is, is possible and it's actually fairly simple. Um, it is basically a one view in the database called Execution Log 3, and it's exactly the same as you know, it has always been in, in, in uh, SQL Server reporting services. So if you've ever done uh, monitoring on SQL Server reporting services, this is the same way you're going to do it for Power BI Repo Server. It's because it's built on the same technology, so it's the same way. There's a lot of information online of how to uh, monitor uh, SQL Server reporting services, uh, and you can apply that to Power BI Repo Server. There are slight differences to how uh, Power BI reports are treated in the execution log in the comparison to a reporting services report. So you might see uh, where there are you know, columns that are filled in for reporting service report that are not filled in for Power BI reports. And you might also see that you know, where you have um, some um, groupings of, uh, uh, of events and they are documented well in the reporting services documentation. So one is a certain event, two is another event, three is a third event. And there might be now new information, so seven, eight, and nine, or something like that, that are applied to Power BI reports, and they might not be documented in the documentation, at least they weren't last time I looked, they might be now. So in some instances, I have had to um, you know, create an event and then see how, what, what, what came out of it uh, to be able to you know, document, internal document. Uh, the events, but I haven't gone through all of them, so I, I know I'm not able to to provide those uh, do, those mappings. But generally speaking, it's simple, uh, it's easy, and it's accessible. So if you have Power BI Report Server, you should be able to get uh, up and running really, really fast. In this session, I suggest three sections of monitoring. So I suggest that you monitor the Power BI admin settings, which you find in the admin portal, typically under the tenant settings. I suggest that you monitor the Power BI advert inventory, so basically create an inventory of what, uh, what you have in your tenant. And I also suggest that you monitor, of course, the activities, so who is doing what, when. So these are the three sections that I suggest you do. These are, these are the, the minimum I suggest. Of course, there might be other things you want, might want to monitor. For example, if you have you know, Power BI Premium, you want to monitor the capacities. Um, if you have uh, the on-premise gateway, you of course want to monitor that. But uh, basically everyone, I in my mind, needs to monitor these three that I suggest here. And the other ones are important, but I don't, haven't included them because they are not for everyone. So before we go into the specifics of each one of these. I just want to talk a little bit about the application of data. So if you go and gather this data, so if you start monitoring uh, Power BI with those three things that I talked about, what can you then do with it? Well, of course, first of all, you will uh, get better insight into what's going on in your Power BI environment. Um, if you don't monitor, you don't know what's going on. And that could be both for, you know, for governance, for are you, am I compliant, am I uh, doing things that I should be doing, or are people doing things that they shouldn't be doing? That is one part of it. But it's also about adoption and implementation. Because if you don't know what's going on, it's very hard to know where you are in your implementation and adoption. So when you have the data, you could, for example, focus your effort of adoption or implementation on a group of people that are in slow in the uptake, or you want to maybe put more resources on people that are you know, going really fast, you know, department that is going really, really fast with Power BI. So when you have those data, you can focus your effort and you can be much, much better in your implementation. And as I said, of course, governance is a huge part of it. Another thing you can do uh, with this data is license maintenance. So for example, if you, uh, you, if you look at the data, if you monitor the activities, you can know that you know, if someone is not using Power BI and they have a Power BI license, you might wanna take that license away and put, give it to someone else. 
course, be careful of taking people's license. You know, they might be they might be that they use only Pavia uh, occasionally, so you know, usually best to contact them first. But this is one thing you know you can take license from people who are not using it and give it to the people who want to be using Pavia. Another thing with license maintainers is that you know if someone signs up for Pavia at Pro Trial, if you allow that. Um, you will see that in the audit log and with that you can also prepare that in within 60 days they will need to have a proper license you know, or they might need it but you are can at least be prepared for it if they want it one other thing that i think you can do with this data is that you can create a, a proper inventory of uh, of what what you have in your power bi tenant so if you are a power bi user just a normal user um, you are not able to see anything in Power BI except the things you have been given explicit access to. So if you haven't been added to a workspace or given a you know, shared report with you, you don't know that a report exists or the workspace exists. By building a, a inventory of, of your you know, Power BI content, you are able to uh, expose a re report, for example, of that inventory to everyone in the organization. And if you do that, people will know what exists. So uh, you could prevent duplication of effort you know, because if a person doesn't know that something exists, they might create it themselves. But if they know it exists, they might you know, not create it, but instead you know, get access to the one that exists already. If you create some of those kind of you know, inventory, it's really, really good to have uh, extra information in that report on, you know, yes, it exists, but how do I get access to it? So who is the owner of it? How do I, you know, who do I contact to get access to it? Is it a ticket or or do I contact the owner directly? So these are the things that I think you know you can do with the data. There are of course probably a bunch of other things that you can do it uh, do with it. It's just a matter of you know figuring out what your organization needs. But the main thing is you need to gather data, otherwise you cannot answer any of these questions. The first part of monitoring that I want to suggest are the tenant settings. And you might be thinking, oh, okay, tenant settings, how, how why do I should I monitor those? Um, and why is that important? So first I will answer the why is it important, then we will cover uh, why you should be monitoring it and how you should be doing it. So first of all, in the tenant settings, or you know, there are other settings in Power BI as well that you should of course be uh, looking at, but the tenant settings are some of the more important ones. So in the tenant settings, there are things that you probably should be modifying, such as published web, you know, hopefully that is turned off or at least turned on for only selective users. Um, also, you know, you should be turning on the audit logs if you haven't already done that. That can be done from Micro 365, uh, from the security and compliance center there, or it can be done from, from Power BI. So if it has been turned on in security and compliance center, it's going to be grayed out in the Power BI uh, admin portal, um, but otherwise it's going to be possible to turn it on there. There are also things that you might want to modify, such as uh, export, uh, you know, sharing outside your company and publish apps to end users. And there are things that are incredibly helpful that I think you know every organization should you know set, which are the internal help page. So this is just an example of things that you know you should maybe be looking at. But the reason why I want you to be monitoring those is that, especially if you have more than one administrator, you know things could be changed you know unintentionally or even un you know intentionally uh, with malice. So. When someone changes something in the tenant settings, provided they have turned on the audit logs, it's going to show up in the audit log that a setting was changed. For example, published to web settings was changed, but it's going to, it's going to say also in the audit log what it was changed to, but it's not going to be you know, it's not going to say what it was changed from. So you're going to know that it was changed. You're going to know what it was changed to, but you don't know what it was changed from. That is why I suggest that you go to the, the admin portal, you look through the tenant settings, you document each and every one of those settings. So take note of each and every one of the settings, write down uh, exactly what it should be set to. So you look at each one of them, you make a informed decision of what they should be, and then you write it down. Because uh, if something changes, you can then uh, revert back to the document and see, okay, this is what it was supposed to be. Now it is this. Is that okay? Is, you know, if it was a proof change, it's fine. You know, update the documentation. If it was not a proof change, you can you know you know what to return it back to. Of course, you can also figure it out again. You know what it was supposed to be, but it's much easier if you have you know, done the proper documentation. So let's check out how it looks and let's see uh, how we would go on about change that. So I am here 
in the Power BI service, I am logged in as a uh, Power BI administrator, uh, and I am here also already in the admin portal. So I've gone to the settings, I click the admin portal, and now I'm here in the uh, in the admin portal. First of all, there are a bunch of things there that are very interesting, uh, but since we are focusing on monitoring, I'm just gonna focus on things that are important for that. None of these settings here, nothing that you put in here can be uh, automatically uh, extracted. So you cannot, there's no API or anything like that that you can uh, extract this data uh, so that you, you don't need to write it down. If you wanna have any of these documented, if you don't have any of these settings you know, uh, written down, you need to write them by hand uh, or you know, of course by computer, but there's no way of you know extracting this automatically. So the tenant settings that I talked about are probably the, the most important one that you need to be careful of because there are things, you know, for example, in the export and sharing settings, there are things that you should be looking at, for example, publish to web. And there are things that you probably want to be looking at, you know, how do you, you know, how do you allow people to export or not? Um, and there are other things in there that you might want to you know, consider. Note that these things here are not static. So sometimes when a Power BI gets a new feature, um, or you know when they change something in Power BI, they will add new uh, settings in here. So you you know you, you cannot just you know write it down once and you know, and think you have it all. You need to be aware of you know uh, if Power BI doesn't change that it might might add things in here. So what am I you know, my uh, uh, suggestion is that you uh, take the uh, you know all these different settings. You look at each one of them. And then you go on and you set it to whatever you know you know, things would be, and then you would write it down that setting, and then you will be able to go and 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 you know check if that you know if a change been made. If if you need to roll that back, it's so much much easier than uh, if you don't haven't written this down. So it's a fairly simple one, and it's a very manual process. It's like a semi-automated uh, process because. As I said, you can see from the uh, audit log that it was changed, and you say what it was changed to. But the the actual you know, documentation is a manual process, and uh, to check if it's still set to what it was supposed to be, it's also a manual process if you want to do that. So you have two ways of doing this. You can either go in and you can manually check everything, or you can wait for an event to happen in the audit log. And if the event happens, you can then go in and check if that event was. Uh, you know, approved event or not. That's probably the way I would, I would you know, suggest that you do it. Uh, but uh, I would still say that, you know, maybe every six months or so, uh, at least probably, you know, even more often, if you know, if you have resources for it, you should go on and check all the settings because as I said, there might be new options within setting or there might be absolutely new settings that you want to be, you know, uh, you know ahead of the curve. So you're not, uh, you know, you're not exposing things to people that you know you don't want to be doing. So there are these are tenant settings, and this is a reason why I think you should be monitoring those. Uh, this is not something that you know there's a lot to talk about, but I think it's very important because uh, uh, these settings are you know very important for for your company. The next part of uh, Power BI monitoring is monitoring your Power BI artifact inventory. This is where you will. Uh, gather information about what you have in your Power BI state. So what objects exists, what artifacts exists, uh, and what has changed. And when I talk about artifacts, I mean like workspaces, reports, dashboards, data flows, data sets, data sources, gateways, and so on and so forth. So what I'm suggesting here is that you gather information about what you have and also what has changed over time so that you can present a a picture of what your uh, your implementation is you know how your implementation is doing if you do this you will be able to uh, much more accurately document you know how your information is doing how your uh, adoption efforts are going uh, and also as i named uh, said before you can also uh, expose this kind of a uh, inventory report out to your organization so that people uh, know what exists and thereby reducing duplicate efforts uh, and even helping inspiring people to get more information uh, instead of being in the dark. So how do you go on about doing uh, uh, getting your data for the artifact inventory? So this is probably the most complicated of the monitoring parts, uh, but it's also the one that you know uh, can be done uh, you know, without too much hassle. So you will go to do this, you will need to go use the Power BI REST API. The Power BI REST API is an API that the Power BI team has developed, 
that exposes different kind of information uh, from Pavia. It's both a you know fetching things, so getting it all, give me all the dashboards. And it's also a, where you can actually uh, write into Power BI, you know, rebind the data set, or um, you know, add a user to a workspace. But in this instance, we are only focusing on the part where we get things out. So if you look at uh, on the screen here, you see that you know I'm on the documentation uh, page for Power BI Desktop. Sorry, sorry for Power BI REST API. And you will see that on the left hand side, you have all the different endpoint uh, sections. You see the first one is called admin, and then the, the rest of them are you know, different parts of, of Power BI. The difference between the admin and the rest is usually so that, that the admin will allow, you know, everything, all the endpoints underneath the admin will allow you to get uh, information about whatever the endpoint has for the whole organization while the other ones are very specific to a, a certain thing and will only allow you to get information about things you have explicit access to. So, for example, um, if you go to the admin one, and if I look at the uh, get groups as admin, this is a classic one. Um, groups in this instance are workspaces, because when Power BI started, um, the workspaces were a Office 365 groups. Now, you know, the Version two of Workspaces is a proper workspace, not an Office 365 group, but the uh, API endpoint is still called Get Groups as admin. If you don't, if you don't know APIs, there are basically a URL uh, endpoint which you can call, uh, and it will return you some data. At least if you are using the Get uh, part of the uh, REST API, you will get data back. If you use Post, you are posting things, but we are like I said, we are only focusing on the on the Get part, so we are getting data out. Um, this one, for example, uh, will get you uh, uh, all, all the uh, all the workspaces because this is an admin uh, endpoint. There are, you know, most of these uh, REST API endpoints. They will have some kind of a, you know uh, attributes or uh, parameters that you can add to it. Uh, you can filter things. You can do all kind of different things with it. The documentation is actually fairly good, um, and it, it will help you uh, get started. Now, a different, you know, uh, so as I said, the admin one will allow you to get everything that you, uh, that you, uh, you know, that exists in the organization, while the normal ones will give you only things that you have explicit access to. For example, apps. Uh, if you look at the apps here, we have something called get apps. Um, and this will return, uh, you know, instances of, of installed apps, but only the ones that you have access to, not everyone, all of them in the organization. So you need to, need to keep that in mind. Now, when you want to use this uh, REST API endpoint, you have a few different options of how you, you know, can call the REST API. You can build your own application if you have experience or if you have someone in the organization that, uh, that knows how to build applications. You can build an application that, you know, that can handle whatever needs to be handled. There needs to be authentication, of course. You need to call the API and then you need to handle the response, which is usually a JSON. Uh, you know, JSON uh, object that comes back. So if you are not uh, able to build your own application or you don't have anyone that can, uh, you can also use uh, PowerShell. So Microsoft have been so kind to us that they have actually taken a lot of these endpoints and they have encapsulated them in Power BI commandlets. A lot of us, not everyone, but a lot of us have you know, some experience with PowerShell. We have tried it out or we have used it for other uh, instances. Um, so uh, PowerShell is, is a little bit easier to get started with than uh, writing an application. If you want to use the you know, PowerShell command list, there's actually a pretty good uh, documentation of that. So there exists, of course, the uh, PowerShell, com uh, no, PowerShell command list for uh, Power BI, but there's also a .NET client library, which I'm not going to you know, uh, go into. But if you look at the PowerShell, you can go to the documentation, and there you will see the documentation of the different uh, modules that are within the uh, uh, Power BI, uh, you know, REST, sorry, the Power BI PowerShell for the REST API. The documentation here is actually pretty good. It will tell you how to install the modules, and you can install the individual modules or the total module and get everything in it. And then you know there's uh, you know an example of most of the commandlets and how to you know how to call them and what they will return. So one thing I want to tell, talk, talk about with when it comes to the commandlets is that the um, the commandlets are built on a certain point in time, of course. Um, so they will uh, take whatever is in the REST API endpoint at that time, and they will encapsulate all that you know 
authentication part and uh, uh, getting taking the data that comes back, the JSON that comes back, and making it into a nice tabular uh, response. So you don't have to do that, which is a really great thing about uh, the uh, commandlets. Thing you need to be aware of with the commandlets, of course, because they're built on a certain time in, a point in time, is that the REST API endpoint might change. Uh, and that it's not certain that the uh, commandlet will change, you know, in, in you know at the same time at least. So, for example, a, a REST API endpoint might now return more data than it did in the beginning, but because the commandlet is taking the uh, the response and creating a tabular output of it, uh, it might only take certain columns, and it might not take the new columns that have been added later on, because you know it was you know created when those didn't exist. Power BI, uh, sorry, Microsoft might uh, you know uh, update those at some point, but then they might not. So this is just what it is. So we have the REST API, we have the REST API endpoints, and we have the commandlets uh, from uh, uh, for PowerShell. So you can use those to get the, all this data that I'm talking about. I prefer to use uh, PowerShell because that's something that I'm uh, you know I know a little bit about. I'm not very good at PowerShell, but I know enough of PowerShell that I can make this work. So let's just take a look at how this uh, how it is, how are the responses, and uh, how about different commandlets, uh, and then we'll also look at calling the REST API directly. Though why are why are powerful? Because Microsoft have been really kind to us. They have created a special commandlet that allows us to collect, uh, sorry, uh, call the endpoints directly. So let's take a look at how that might be. So I'm here in PowerShell. I'm in PowerShell seven and. This will work in most power shells. Uh, there are certain command lists that will only work in, in newer, newer power shells, um, but there are most of them that will work um, in, in, in all different kinds of versions. I have already logged in to Power BI. So there are different ways you can do this. Um, if you want to, of course, run these, uh, run these power shell scripts that, so that they are unintended, you will need to somehow take care of logging. You can do that by having a PowerShell file with the login information that you call. You can encrypt it into Windows. There are different ways you can do this, and um, but of course you don't want to, you know, you don't want to be to, to be interactive. But I have an interactive login here because I'm just gonna, you know, I'm just demoing this, and there is a a there is a Power BI uh, uh, sorry a, a commandlet um, that is uh, called login Power BI. You can call this. If you call this, it will ask you to log in, and then when I do this. Uh, it will just tell me, you know, you're logged into this tenant as this kind of uh, this user, and then you're logged in, and then you know, for this session, I don't need to log in again. Of course, like I say, this is not you know attainable and not doable when you're running this you know on a schedule. So that's you know, you can either have it as a clear text in your you know in your PowerShell script, not recommended, or you can you know do all kind of other different ways to do it. But there's plenty of information about on the net about that. Okay, so let's let's uh, let's try out uh, a simple commandlet. So I'm gonna show you a commandlet which is called get Power BI Workspace. Now the get Power BI Workspace uh, commandlet is the same uh, is calling the uh, get groups as admin, uh, uh, you know, uh, a REST API endpoint. Although um, it is uh, it is when I when I run it as just normally like this. Uh, it will get me all the workspaces that I have access to, not all the ones in the organization. So here you can see, you know, I have a different kind of workspaces. It delivers me an ID, the name, is it read-only, is it orphaned, is it on dedicated capacity, and a capacity ID. And if I look at the documentation for the uh, for the REST API endpoint, I will see that you know, it, will, it, it will not give me the state, and it will not give me the type, and not give me the description. So it doesn't give me everything that, you know, the and the REST API endpoint does, and that's also you know, what I named before, is it, it doesn't have to do that. It might, it might not. Okay, so that was one. Let me just see, what if we, uh, what if we go on instead, oh, sorry, and we call it with a scope organization and a uh, slash all. So scope organization will tell it, now give me everything in the organization. This will only work if you are a Power BI administrator that is logged in. And the scope, the, the, the uh, hyphen all, that will give me all of them instead of giving me the top 500, I think, or something like that. Mm -hmm. So with this, you will get all the workspaces in the organization. So I'm in a demo, small demo tenant, so there's not going to be a lot. 
um, but it still, you know, it, it gives me a little bit more. This will also give you uh, personal workspaces, so it will give you everything, all the, uh, you know, uh, the workspaces in your container. And you can see that uh, I have something called a group, and I have something called a personal group. Uh, and you will see that you know they 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 are a different thing you know so a personal group is of course uh, my workspace while a group is 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 a um, a group is is what you know you will get when you have uh, the old groups and workspace is what you get when you have the the new workspace sorry group is the old workspaces and, and workspace is the the new workspaces and if I could scroll a little bit down again. And you will you will see that you know some of them are active, while some of them will be you know deactive or uh, you know, even deleted. Okay, so that was uh, oh, sorry. I'm gonna do it again just to see. So even though I do the uh, you know so when I do the you know slash all, I will they slash very slash organization. I will get a little bit more information. See, it's not exactly the same information that I got before. Now I will get something about users. So I have an admin here. Uh, which is called something specific, uh, you know, on, on, a, on a different. So I don't get that on a personal workspace, of course, but I get it on a, on normal workspaces. So I have, uh, I get a little bit more uh, more information. So you will see that you know, yeah, uh, although also very similar, but I get the users now. But this is still not exactly the same as that we got before. As with the. Uh, the uh, get workspace command that we have a very similar you know, command that, that works for reports. So just to give you an example of that, so let me just go on and get the code here and I'm gonna run it. And this will give me information about all my reports. So I have the organization on it, so it will give me all my reports. And you will see that it gives me the ID, the name, the web URL, the embed URL and the data set ID. So I have, you know, and it's nicely tabular formatted. It I could output this into a you know CSV file or even to a database, and it will just be a really nice way of collecting this data information. This one here, the uh, the Power, get Power BI report is getting the is using the the command let sorry the REST API endpoint called get reports as admin. And when I look at that, you know, the, you see this is the one, so, you know, the data I'm getting back. So this is really nice. The uh, it's getting me oh, everything that the uh, the you know documentation telling me it should be getting. But there is a catch, because I know that there is you know the the endpoint is actually giving me more than the uh, command that is giving than the documentation set, uh, and. If you are in a situation where you either know it or you suspect that you know the command that is not giving you what you need, you could try to call the REST API directly. And as I said, you know, Microsoft have been really kind to us, so they have created a special command that allows us to call the REST API directly. Now let's take a look at how that might look. So the rest, the commandlet that Microsoft have created is called invoke Power BI REST method. It is a special command that allows us to call uh, uh, the Power BI REST API. There exists a gener generic one called invoke REST method, um, but this one is specific for Power BI. It takes uh, two parameters. One is the URL. So basically, what are the URL you want to call? And like in this case, you know, this is the URL that we want to call. So the HTTPI, you know, HTTPS colon, you know, slash slash, all that different things. And all the way out to the report. And of course, if you have any parameters you want to add to the uh, to the uh, REST API endpoint, you can also add those. Now, you don't have to have the whole URL in. You only have to have everything after my org. So you could just have admin reports in this case. So, you know, but I have the whole URL here. It's just for transparency. It's easier to see. So let me show you how the URL could look. I'm just going to do a simple one. And it's just just the URL as you see it above. That's it. As I said, I could you know be filtering on a specific report, or I could be uh, filtering on a specific workspace. Um, if I would be using you know the one below, get reports in groups as admin, then I can filter on a specific workspace. Um, so there are you know, different options that you have. In this case, I'm just gonna do the uh, just the the, the uh, normal one. Of course, I need to tell Power BI what method uh, are, am I using. So the method I'm using is get. So these are the two parameters you need. You need the URL and you need the method. If you were adding a user to a, to a workspace, you would be using the method post. But you know we are only focusing on the get one now. So if I run this now, 
just as it is now here, I will get a JSON response instead of getting this nice formulated you know, tabular format. But mm -hmm. what I will get is that I will get, for example, uh, I will get, you know, created date time, modified date time, modified by and created by. So these are, can be very valuable information. So you know who cre created the report, you know when they created the report, you know, you know who you know, modified it uh, and when they modified it. So you could, you know, if you call the REST API directly, you will get this. If you use the commandlet, you won't get it. Maybe you don't need it. And then the REST API, the, the commandlet is much, much easier uh, because, you know, here I have a JSON response and I need to handle that response. Uh, it is not very complicated to handle JSON in PowerShell if it's only one level like this is, but you know some of the REST API endpoints will uh, come back with multi-level JSON that can be uh, hard to to handle. But there are plenty of things out there that can handle JSON. So I, for example, I often just output this as a JSON file, and then I use something else than PowerShell because my PowerShell skills are not fantastic. Uh, I will use something else than PowerShell to to uh, uh, to parse the JSON. But that's just uh, totally up to where your skills lay, uh, what where you prefer to do it. Note that you know these created by and, cre and modified by are just the GUIDs, and, and to get the name of the person or the email of the person, you will need to connect to uh, Azure Active Directory. Uh, this is the GUID that exposed there. So Azure Active Directory also has an API where you can go and fetch those uh, you know information about the users. An added benefit of, of doing that, of getting the users from the uh, from Azure Active Directory, other than to interpret this into a to a name, is that often in the Active Directory you will find information such as you know department, job title, and all kind of different you know information about the the user. And if you get that, you are you know your you know inventory report starts getting much more interesting because you will have you know you can you know split it up by department or. You know, you can give you know information about the the uh, creator and the uh, you know or, or the owner of the report by you know showing some some you know more metadata about them. So it's easier for users to request access, and it's also easier for them to know if the report is relevant to them. So I highly recommend that you know looking into Azure Active Directory to get you know part of that uh, data out. But okay, so this is this was just a report, uh, and then we have the, uh, the we did the groups as well. There are a couple of other things that I want to show you about uh, these uh, these REST API endpoint and uh, and commandlets. So let me just find the next one here. And as I said, you know, the invoke Power BI REST method will allow you to call call, call the uh, uh, the REST API directly. Um, the one that we looked at before, which was you know get groups as admin. So get groups as admin will give you all the workspaces as I said before. Um, but there is a possibility, you know, remember I, when I showed you before that we did, you know, with the command let we got, you know, uh, most of the, uh, the uh, columns back and it was actually quite decent what we could get. But when you're building up a, a, a inventory like this, you will want to get the workspaces, you will want to get the reports, you will want to get the you know, dashboards, the users, the data flows and all these different things. And all these different things, they belong to a workspace. So if you want to get do some kind of a lineage or a hierarchy of things, you will need to then start grouping things together. And the way we used to do this was by, you know, call, you know calling and looping through things. We get all our workspaces, we look through all our workspaces and get all our reports. Look through all the workspaces and get you know, all the dashboards and so on and so forth. Because we have this, you know, get reports in groups as admin, which, you know, requires a... a a uh, workspace ID, so we need to look through them and get you know so all the reports in this workspace and then all the reports in the next workspace, and so all these loops we need to do. But then Microsoft uh, helped us out again by adding in a parameter to the uh, to the get groups as admin, which is called expand. And expand parameter uh, will allow you to get the related uh, users, reports, dashboards, data flows, data sets, and workbooks. And this can be very, very useful because now you can get one call and you get all that information. You might want to call the you know get reports as admin anyway because you might want to get you know more information about the report because this will not only give you some of the you know, information, but this will give you the hierarchy. So you don't need to loop through all the things. So you could get do this and then you can get you know all the reports and then you can just simply chain them together in your data model 
and then you have you know all the information about the repos but you also have the lineage of which you know workspace does this this report belong to and that is very uh, that can be very valuable so how do you do that uh, again we will going to be use the uh, sorry we're going to be using the invoke power bi rest method um, and i'm going to be calling the uh, the the groups um, in the endpoint. The groups endpoint is a little bit different because it does actually require you to use the top um, the top uh, f you know, parameter because uh, the top parameter will uh, will you know give you uh, you know will tell you how many you can you can only get five thousand. So if you have more than five thousand, you will need to then start you know uh, you know uh, paging. You know, so you get the first five thousand, and then you get the next five thousand. You can, you can. That's you know, it's actually documented quite well how you do it. So you need to be aware of that. So the first parameter I have is uh, that it needs to be the top five thousand. So I'm simply uh, replacing the percent with uh, you know a percent twenty four. Then say top five thousand, and then I have the uh, you know the expand parameter. And now I will tell you what uh, do I want and what are my options are. My options are all those different things that I actually showed you before. It's reports, dashboards, data set users, and data flows. I could get workbooks as well. I don't have any workbooks, so I'm not going to do that. But workbooks is one of the things you can get as well. And if there is no data flow in the workspace, it would just you know, return an empty. And this will return a multi-level uh, uh, JSON because you know you have workspace and to the workspace belongs you know uh, is there a, you know, a child attribute of the workspace is a you know a report for the Melora data flow or whatever it is so I could run it like this and I will run it like this oh sorry cannot run it like this because I wanted to say method get and then it will give me all those different things. And you see that, you know, some of them, I'm just gonna scroll up a little bit to get to a real workspace. A lot of these are personal workspaces. I'm just gonna get all the way to the top, it's much better. So I have a workspace here called Outskills Modern Workspace. And in that I have reports that are these. And then I have, you know, dashboards that are these. I have data sets, uh, I have users. Um, all the different uses and the, what, whatever you know, do they are the admins, contributors, or whatever they are, um, and then I have data flows. So in this work, workspace, I actually have uh, users, uh, data flows, data sets, reports. Don't have any dashboards though. So you will get all these different things, the information with the, with this call, all in one call, which is fantastic. So this is something that I use a lot uh, to get my base information and then I call the other REST APIs to get all the other information so I can gather it into a nice uh, you know, in inventory. You can also you know, call this much more specifically. I can call this, for example, I can say that you know, here I have added a, a filter and I'm telling you, give me a very, very specific workspace and everything that's in that workspace. So if I run that, Right. If I run that, it will give me only that one workspace and everything that's in that. So this is something you can do also when you are doing other things. When you need to, you know, need to just uh, display something in a in a um, in an application or whatever. But I, you know, I normally use this to uh, to gather all the whole inventory. So that's why I normally don't do this. But I just want to show you that it's possible to do all kind of filtering. You know, you can get only the active workspace, and there's all kind of different things you can do. Okay, so that was what I wanted to show you from the REST API. Uh, I just you know, just to recap here. Uh, this is the way you will be able to create your uh, your inventory. You use the REST API endpoints either by creating your own application or using PowerShell. As you can see, that you know, I, I like to use PowerShell because it's something it's simple for me because that's something that I know. Um, and then I, I will normally just output the JSON files or the you know, CSV if I'm if I'm using the commandlets, and then I will pick that up later. And I'm going to talk about the architecture a little bit later on, but that's just how I, I would go on about it. Okay, so let's go on to the next one. The last section I think you should definitely be monitoring is the Power BI activities. This is usually what you start with because this is a, one of the most important ones. You know. If you are thinking about compliance or governance, is what people are doing. So, 
when you are monitoring activities, you could be looking at things such as adoption, as to how who is using Power BI, and again, who is not using Power BI. As I said before, you can use it to relocate, reallocate the licenses. You want to look at you know, who is doing what, you know, viewing or deleting or whatever, and what are they doing, and when are they doing that. Uh, you can also use the data for auditing purposes for very specific things, so you don't want to look at you know, what did that person do at this specific time. But wherever your reasons are, uh, collecting the Power BI activities is very, very important. Power BI activities are stored in the Microsoft Security and Compliance Center in Office 365, or Microsoft 365 as they're called now. So uh, let's take a look at how it works. So first of all, if you go to the audit logs here, you will see, uh, so again, sorry, I'm in the uh, uh, admin portal in the Power BI service. I am logged in as an administrator, that's why I can see all this. So if you go to the audit logs, you will see there is no audit logs here. So there's only a button saying, take me to the Microsoft 365 admin center. If I just jump over to the tenant settings and I scroll all the way down a little bit more up, there is a audit and usage settings that you can go on and set. First of all is this create audit logs for internal activity, activity auditing and compliance. You can see this is grayed out in my case is because in my tenant, uh, this is set on a global level within Microsoft 365. If it was not set, you, I could turn it on here or I could turn it off here. So you should definitely check this out. If it's not turned on, you want to turn this on very, very soon because the sooner you do, the sooner you have you know, data to tell what's going on. So because uh, the, the data is not stored in the, uh, in the Power BI tenant, it's stored in Microsoft 365, uh, you cannot look at it here. If I click on this button, it will take me to the uh, audit log search in the unified audit log in the Office 5 Security and Compliance Center. Um, if you want to get access to this here, you need to either be a, a Office 5 admin or you need to be a, a auditor, which is a role so which has a view only uh, uh, options for this particular um, you know, center here. Um, the problem with this is that you know if the if the Office 65 admins want to give you an auditor role, they will need to give you a permission to look at the all the logs. So they cannot say you will only be able to see the Power BI logs. They will need to give you all the logs. And the logs here are everything from file and page activity to SharePoint um, to you know OneDrive for business and everything that you know exists within your uh, Office 65 tenant. It's what's logged in here. So. This can be a very a big hurdle to get access to the audit logs. If you get access to the audit logs here, you can go on here and say, you know, uh, like see, there are a lot of different logs in here. But if you start writing Power, you will see then the Power BI activities, which are something around, you know, I don't think they're around 100 now. When I started this out, there were 20, 30 here and there, but they always get more and more and more. Uh, also, as both as Power BI evolves, but also when there comes new function functionality within Power BI. Microsoft often adds an uh, activity or, uh, for those particular uh, new features. So there are a bunch of you know just normal features. You know in the in the in the in the top there is all these you know classical uh, events that you know you want to monitor. You know someone created a Power BI report or someone edited a Power BI report or, or someone uh, let's say viewed a Power BI report is somewhere here. Oh, let's say deleted a Power BI report. It doesn't really matter. We would a Power BI report is here. So you can check all these different things if you have access to this. You can check whatever you know, events you want to look at. You cannot check them all because that's too many for these uh, for this interface. So when, when I check them all, I can set a time frame. So I, I'm just gonna set a specific time frame because I know that something happened in my demo tenant at that point. Then I can say search, and this will give me all the activities. You know, all these these four activities uh, within this time frame for my tenant. And you can see there are a few of them here, and and then you know you can you can click on one of these and you will see something you know, you know what what this you know this is a view Power BI report the Power BI report is called Seasons Graph, and then there's you know a bunch of information about uh, who did it what kind of you know browser did they use who was it you know all this different information that you want to know. But this is not a very sustainable solution. You could you can go here and you know you can download the results giving you a CSV file. But as I say, you don't want to be doing this manually because the problem with this is that the data in here is stored for uh, 90 days by default. Uh, your organization might have a different retention policy. They might have a shorter 
or they might have a longer depending on uh, you know so they can get a longer if they have a specific you know office 65 license uh, but they have to actively go in and change it so most organizations are on 90 days so this one you know things get deleted after the 90 days so you want to be harvesting this you don't want to just go in here and look uh, and check it out you want to be looking at it in a you know taking it out uh, storing it in a good place and, and and then you can look at the store history that is longer than 90 days just be aware of course that you know the data in here can be personally identifiable so you have an email address for example so you just need to be sure that you are storing it you know in a, in a good way and not exposing it to uh, to people who are unauthorized you know an IP address and all these different things so if you have access to this, you can go on and, and look at it here, but you can also use the Microsoft, uh, uh, sorry, the Office 365 uh, admin API to get it out. Um, the admin API is a you know, fairly simple one. Uh, it also exists a commandlet for it. You can run the commandlet and then it will give you all the information that you need. The only thing you need to be aware of when you're running the commandlet or going against the REST API is that you need to filter on Power BI. Uh, because if you don't filter on Power BI, you will get all the logs. Now, depending on how your organization organizes itself, you know, maybe you, you know, the best thing for your organization is to export all the logs into a data warehouse and then split it up after that. So you will uh, then have a section for Power BI, a section for SharePoint and all these different things. And then the uh, administrators of Office 65, they will own the extraction part of it. Then you don't need to have access to this and everyone is happy. But if, uh, if you only want Power BI and you have access to this, you can filter on so you only get the Power BI order logs. Now, because this was a really, really difficult thing, you know, because you know, it's very hard to get access to this, uh, Microsoft decided that they needed to give you know, Power BI administrator a little bit more uh, of an option of how to get this data out. So what they did was they added an endpoint to the uh, REST API for Power BI. Which, oops, sorry, which will allow you to get it out. So there is an endpoint now called get activity events. So now for this, you only need to be a Power BI administrator. You don't need to be an auditor. You don't need to be an Office 65 admin. You just need to be a Power BI administrator. And then you can use this uh, endpoint and you can get the uh, activity data out. Notice that it is called audit in one side and activity in the other one. So, you know, take care of the, uh, the terminology sometimes. You know, it's called one thing, sometimes called another one. Even though it's called audit log, it's called activity events here. If you want to call this REST API, it's fairly simple. You can use it here. It has only, uh, you know, a couple of things you need to think about. Uh, you can, of course, filter on a specific thing, but if you just want to export it, the only thing you need to add to it is a start date and time and an end date time. Beware that the start date time and end date time need to be within the same day. So you cannot take all the you know, all the days in here. And another thing you need to be aware of with the uh, REST API here is that it will only be able to get the last 30 days. So it won't get the whole 90 days. So if you're just starting out now, uh, it would be best if you have an option to get uh, all the logs from the uh, security and compliance center, all the 90 days, and then you can use this one here to get the, all the new days. So my recommendation is when you have gotten the, the as much history as you can get, then you start running this once a day and you always run it for yesterday. So you make sure that you don't have partial days. You only take full days. Um, and of course, you know, you need to be aware of if it fails, you need to go and, you know, and get it again uh, because uh, you don't want to be having missing days in between because at some point those days will disappear from the audit log. Power BI has also, uh, Microsoft have also been so nice to us that they also created a commandlet for this. Uh, so you don't have to call the REST API. Uh, you can call the REST API in the same way as I showed before, but you can also uh, just call the commandlet and it will return the same things as the as the audit log, as, as the REST API endpoint itself, at least at the moment. So you need to be aware of that, of course. So should we take a look at that, how that work? So back into PowerShell, uh, and I'm gonna go on and I'm gonna get Let's go here. So here I have uh, simply uh, set, you know, I'm going to call the get a Power BI activity events uh, commandlet, which is the one that, you know, will call this particular uh, REST API endpoint. I have a start date time and I have an end date time. Now, one thing I want to point out is that in the examples here, all the examples here, um, you will see that the, the date time here, it does not have a 
uh, a single quotation mark around it, but it does have to have it around it, otherwise it won't work, both in the REST API and in the commandlet. So even though the, the documentation says no you know, quotation mark, it needs to be there. I am taking on one specific day and I'm going from you know midnight to uh, one second to midnight. So this will give me the whole thing. Oh. I'm running it now. It might take just a second to, to go and get it. Um, and then we will hopefully get all it. So, so here we have the results. Again, this is a, a JSON that comes back. And you can see the first, uh, the last one here is the import one. So the operation is import and these are the things that you know, follow it. Import is basically when someone publishes from Power BI Desktop. Next one is get groups as admin. And notice that this event here has much fewer um, uh, you know columns or uh, you know uh, attributes than the other one than this one here so they are not always the same uh, same attributes to follow each event because each event has different things so you need to be aware when you build your data model then you need to your data model needs to be built to uh, take the whole thing so there's not much more to say about getting the activity events that you know you need just need to you know I would just you know try to get the whole history first then I would use the uh, REST API endpoint use the commandlet and and get it out um, start storing it you know however you want to store it and then just you know uh, run it every day it's very simple much more simple than the inventory because it's only simply a one a commandlet or one REST API endpoint that you need to call um, and then you start storing the data. So that was it for the three different sections of uh, uh, you know monitoring. Now I want to talk a little bit about how you can then automate and put the architecture up so it makes sense. I promised that I would show you a little bit of what you can do to report on the data. And here is an example of, of a report that I have created or a couple of reports that I created. So first of all, this one is focused on the user activities. So in this overview page, you can see, you know, what are the you know, reports that have had biggest you know, views, which are the top 10 active workspaces, and then activity by users over a period of time. Of course, take in mind, this is my demo tenant, so it's very, very few users and a lot of, not a lot of activity. I also have, you know, saying who, uh, how many active users do I have out of the total users? You know, this is in the period that I have here, and the same for reports and dashboards and workspaces and so on and so forth. And then I have a, a, a page per uh, activity. So I have like an overall page for the, all the user activity where you can filter on whatever activity you want. And I also have, you know, which period people have been uh, inactive. So if they have been uh, inactive for a long time, I might, you know, withdraw their license maybe. And I have creators, viewers, data deletes, and all these different activities. But because I have also the uh, inventory, I can do things such as this one here where I have uh, created a report page where I have the activity. So basically, uh, what hours of day do people mostly view reports? How often do they do it over time? What are the most viewed reports, similar to as before? And here is the inventory part on the right hand side. So how has my inventory of reports been developed over time? And who are the creators of reports in my organization? So I could, of course, add some more slices so that I could have it. So this is what you get by having you know, combine uh, the activities with the uh, with the inventory. You can you know show both how the inventory is developing, who are the owners who are most active in that way, uh, who own most uh, uh, you know content, and also uh, how much this is used and by who and, and when. So this is what I suggest you do. You you know take the audit log, you take the inventory, and you combine it into one. You also might want to have an inventory report that are separate, which you know, for the purpose I talked about before, if you just want to show people what's going on, so what exists in your environment so they can apply for access to it. So I want to round off the, uh, the talk here by talking about how you could perhaps architect a solution like this. So when I do this, I normally try to go the cloud way, but there's nothing wrong with going the uh, on-premise way as well. If you decide to go the cloud way, I have had great success with you know, running my PowerShell script as an Azure function apps, writing the data down into a blob storage as a JSON files, and then picking that up with Azure Data Factory and writing it into a, you know, a SQL data warehouse. If you, of course, you know, want to use other tools, that's fine. You know, most integration tools, they can know how to parse JSON and, and, and you know, most 
uh, integration tool can also run PowerShell scripts, or you can use SQL Server, agent, SQL Server agent or something like that to run the PowerShell script. So there's plenty of ways, and this is just the one way uh, that I think you know and have, has worked for me. So to round off the objectives, I wanted you to know why you should be monitoring Power BI. I wanted you to know what you should be monitoring in Power BI. And I wanted to know how you can monitor Power BI and a little bit of how you can automate that. I wanted you to also to have an idea of what you can do with the data and how you can report on it. Hopefully, you have uh, you know we have fulfilled those objectives. Uh, but please, you know, uh, participate in the chat if you have any questions. Before you stop, uh, I really hope you you know fill out the session evaluation. It will help me a lot, and it will also help pass a lot, creating a better event. So thank you very much. My name is Dalke Gunnarsson and I hope you have enjoyed the last 60 minutes. I will be here to answer questions if you need it. Thank you.